So what I'm going to do is bring up this for Charles, and we're going to pretty much talk about uh, a little bit about the LSI. Grab the Charles, you want to grab that mouse there and kind of go over it, and we'll start from there. Let's make sure the screen is visible. There it is for everybody. So I guess this is the channel roadmap that we're going to be kind of focusing on the LSI Enterprise RAID products. And um, pretty much what we see mostly in the industry is the 9260s and 9280s and the 9265s and 9285s. Sure. Thanks, Todd. Uh, yeah, basically the uh, the 9265 and 85 are um, functionally similar in terms of, you know, using all the same tools and, um, and you know, the same uh, RAID levels and things like that. They're just more powerful, particularly in the field of IOPS. So we'll get into some more specifics, but mainly um, the 65 and 85 are drop-in replacements. If you happen to be using the 9260 and 9280, you're looking at something new. You can go straight to the 6595. So the the lower ends, uh, the 9240s are just for entry level, small amounts of yeah, you know, options, storage. But right, yeah. right. What's going on with the cash vault? So cash vault is is a new thing that we're uh, we're just bringing down. Basically, it replaces uh, batteries. So it gives you the ability to have um, the same functionality of a battery in terms of if you have an unscheduled power outage, your cache is backed up. But in this case, instead of a battery that may have to be replaced every one or two years, um, it's actually backed up with flash, um, non-volatile memory. And there's a, a small um, battery backup, uh, not battery backup, but a small um, power component on the, um, the cache vault unit that basically provides power as the data in milliseconds is being transferred from controller cache to the non-volatile cache vault. What's the lifespan on that, you know? Uh, I know we the warranty is uh, three years, so much longer than your traditional battery. Right. So it looks like you have a dual core uh, SAS uh, six gig, right? Yes, this is just um, basically some more details on our 92. The this is some technical details on the components, but this is the uh, 9265, 9285 we spoke about before. Um, and in the bottom right, you can see there the either the 8i, um, 8e, or the 66 8i, or 9285 CV. Um, those are basically the options, the two in the kind of olive green that allow you to have the cash vault option. Okay, so the, all the green, so if I have the 9266, they're basically bundled as a package? Yeah, so with the 66, it's it's a little bit different. It's, it's a standalone board, and you can have either a battery um, or a CV uh, kit, whereas with the 85, you basically have to have the 85 CV SKU. Got so it. So it's just a specific SKU. Right, 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 right. Okay. And in the bottom left just shows yeah. how just how powerful these controllers are in terms of even megabytes per second from a sequential standpoint, but you know, particularly on the IOPS, I mean, literally we've seen with just eight SSDs, um, I've seen real, you know, in in uh, demos uh, upwards of 400,000 IOPS. Really? Yeah. Now, so I mean, very, very obviously, powerful. do you need more SSDs to go even higher, or is that a set of SSDs? Let's say if I have... You said four. If I had, uh, let's say, double the amount, you know, typically when we think yeah. of spindles, the more spindles you have, right, you, the, the, the more performance you get. Correct. Yeah. So basically in that demo, I'm sorry, I said four. I meant eight. There were eight SSDs. And depending on the SSDs you get, I mean, one of the things about SSDs is that you want to focus on the enterprise level SSDs. They'll provide you that much more um, performance and reliability. So if you go for a true enterprise level SSD, you can get, even with just eight, you know, upwards of 400,000 uh, IOPS. And, again, it all depends on your exact I.O. load and your I.O. Right, right. Like that, but the possibility is there. Right, right. So the so basically when you have uh, – and once again, everybody, if you have questions, uh, please ask. Charles is a wealth of knowledge here, and, and now's the time to take advantage of it. Um, so, you know, I guess when you add the cascade and the SSDs mm -hmm. and the high-performance drives, we can achieve those – the random rights and so forth, or is yeah, it sequential? Well, so Cascade is kind of a, a middle ground between all spinning drives and all SSDs. So you wouldn't quite get the 400,000 IOPS, but you would get uh, much more than um, you would with uh, with spinning drives. Correct. Or, or to your point, you may have to have like 200 spinning drives 
you could have just a few spinning drives and a couple SSDs. And if your data is cached on the SSDs, particularly think about reads, right. if you have, you know, a good 20% or 10, 15% of your whatever application data um, hotspot on those SSDs, the IOPS just explode for a much lower cost. Um, yeah, here's just a diagram of our of our CV um, series. and basically just shows you the, you know, the power module, the actual um, non-volatile module, and one of the, the clips. What's not shown here, there's actually another um, PCB that you actually mount those two, the two elements on the bottom. You can actually mount those onto a PCB um, in a slot, you know, uh, in your uh, in your server to okay. keep it nice and solid. Right, you right. You can mount it yourself if you have another option. If you, you know, sometimes. Uh, so like Velcro and double stick tape. Well, <laughs> sometimes customers will have their own custom location. They say, I don't want it. In this, I don't want to take it up a slot. I want it in this corner. Right, right, right. Get everything set up. Build a little metal basket. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's it's optional. But yeah, this is just a nice, you know, out of the box. Got it, got it. Thing. You know, I put a circle here. If everybody looks at, there's a red circle I put right in here. It's on the uh, card. When I first received the 9265 from LSI, um, it's a very tiny chip that you receive, yes. and uh, you, you place that. And it's called. It's it's noted on the card as key. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you're able to place that, and of course, it really only occupies two pins. Yes. <clears throat> so and then it obviously it goes in one direction, so you won't have an issue of being able to identify which way it goes. Yeah. But uh, you need to put that in. Now, is that pre-coded before it ships? Is that pre-coded, that, that key, before it ships to the end user or to the reseller? Well, that's you do buy it as a separate SKU. Okay. So um, it would be in a separate package with its own license agreement and everything like that for purchasing the cash pay option. Got it. Okay. Let's talk about the cash vault. So let's go ahead. Yes, yeah, so again, just a little bit more detail mm -hmm. on cash vault. As I mentioned before, using NAND flash powered by a super, what we call a super capacitor or super cap, um, to perform the basic same function that, uh, if you're familiar with BBUs, that a battery backup would um, would address. So again, it's it's allowing you to, and the super cap is there just to provide power for the few milliseconds it takes to transfer that data from the cache on the board to the NAND flash backup, and um, and then once it's there, you know, it can sit there instead of, you know, uh, with a BBU, you may have 72 hours or 48 hours right, depending on how right, much time. Right. With NAN flash, I mean, it's NAN flash, so it could be a week, two weeks, however long you need. How much is that? Do you know? Do you have anything? In what, what? Um, I have no idea. The beauty of being an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> I know that one. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, this is what we're really going to be talking about, and I think this is our last slide before we start getting right into it. So, um, yeah, tell us about the Cascade a little bit. Yeah, so as an example, I mean, I, I mentioned it uh, briefly before, but what Cascade gives you is the ability to leverage SSDs without going all the way SSD. From a cost standpoint, that can be uh, a huge benefit. So, for example, um, these are some uh, just some examples that we've done. We try to get, I mean, your exact application and your environment is always going to dictate your specific performance, but we try to provide some basic examples here of how if you think about it in the read case, I mean, there's also write caching, but it's just a simple way to think about caching on the read side is you've got a database that's 100%. You have, you know, 10 or 15% of that database that's being hit. You know, it's, we call it a hot spot. So it's the, most, it's the most accessed part of the database. And if you put it all on spinning drives, you're kind of having to go all out and buy, you know, large numbers of spinning drives to get the IOPS you need or to improve your IOPS performance. But if you can take, you know, even one or, or two SSDs and what the Cascade Pro software will do is automatically sense those hotspots as you're accessing the data, moving those hotspots or that hotspot data to the SSDs. So then when you come in to do your access, it knows that that data is on the SSDs instead of having to go out to the spinning drives. So it has, so it has an algorithm in there or yeah, it's automatic. And, and, and the very, it's, it's watching the, the use of the data, Absolutely. how it's being accessed, and, and the time of access, and, and then of course it's uh, more used and less used, and then it sorts it out over a period of time. Absolutely. Which, if you think about it, you know, for I know out of curiosity, 
the I went to search to see how much the cash cave was actually, mm-hmm. and it's about uh, I think about four or with two hundred and I saw it on Amazon for like two hundred and seventy dollars or sixty dollars something like that. Well, yeah, and if you compare that cost, say for, for example, I mean there there are customers that can take even seventy two hundred RPM SATA drives for their main database, and then because of the accelerated performance you get from the SSDs, you know two SSDs and and six um, uh, 7,200 RPM SATA drives and get, you know, thousands of IOPS, um, which you would never think about from the, that slow uh, Correct. hard drive. Correct. Because you're leveraging the SSDs can really accelerate your performance. And just one last thing, an, uh, another big benefit is if you think about the way that a rebuild affects your um, I.O. or the way your I.O. affects a rebuild, if you're doing a rebuild and, you know, you're you're having to access – Let's say if you have eight um, spinning drives, you're having to access all eight of those spinning drives while you're to do your rebuild while you're continuing to do I/O. So you want to get your array back to an optimal state, but you can't stop I/O to do that. So your rebuild is going to take that much longer, or your I/O is going to be affected by the rebuild. Interesting, you bring that up because we get a lot of customers that you know they do have a degraded raid, mm-hmm. um, and they re- they're doing a rebuild. And, of course, the rebuild, a lot of them will increase the percentages, what we have right. in our GUI. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but typically it defaults to 30%. Right. Now, we get a lot of customers say, okay, when they're doing a rebuild, and we tell them that we really recommend that they finish the rebuild first mm-hmm. before they actually access the system. Sure. And, and, and I think that becomes a, a – because anything can happen in a vulnerable state, and sure. you're totally down. Sure. sure. Uh, and you've lost your data unless you've backed it up. So but, yeah, and if you have that, if you have that luxury, that's great. And you know, it is if in a, if you can, that's definitely the best idea. But if for some reason you can't back off your I/O, um, the initial, the additional uh, benefit of Cache Cave Pro is that that hotspot data that's being accessed on the SSDs, every time an I/O goes to those SSDs, it's not having to go out to the hard drives. So your rebuild is going to finish that much faster. Because oh, not right, 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 exactly. That makes so, sense. Yeah, so if you're in a case where you have to keep going, you're that much better off in terms of your rebuild speed because you're not having access to hard drives every single time. And probably more the reason why you probably want to do a RAID 1 on your SSDs when something like that, so that way you really have some security. That, yeah, it gives you... You're adding another 9 to the percent. Right, right. That's right. another thing that we added. With and, and it's funny you mentioned about that. Uh, and by the way... Um, Charles doesn't know, everyone, that we're actually using the 7200 drives. I'm using the Seagates of the one terabyte. They have an 8.5 millisecond on the uh, uh, right on the read and a 9.5 on the right. And so that's what we have in the system. All right, well, let's get going and show, show what we have here. So we're done with the PowerPoint. And let's go ahead and bring up the... Uh, what we want to show, I have the DSS up here, but before we show the DSS, we probably want to let everybody know that you want to set up uh, the Mega Raid Storage Manager first for your caching. So here, uh, you you can use the, as you mentioned, the BIOS of the uh, LSI Raid Controller. Uh, here, I'm demonstrating that I'm using the LSI, the Mega Raid Storage Manager 8.33 version. Um, that's out right now that works with the uh, the LSI 9265 with the Cascade. Yeah, I'm sorry. One, <clears throat> one quick point to make is that we're we're actually just releasing this Cascade Pro 2.0 for the 9265 85. Um, it is currently released for the 9260, 9280. That's already up on our website. You want to go through the advanced software options um, section of the website, and that will have all the right um, – Firmware and um, and uh, utilities as well. So when they first purchase it, they go right down here to the mega um, manage mega rate advanced storage options. Yes. Well, there's also a section on our website, and I mean this will also oh, okay. as you're setting up, right. you're setting up your your configuration. Right. Um, in terms of uh, firmware, and then if you're going to use MSM, those versions for the 9265 and 85 will be posting by the, should be posted by the end of this week. Okay. They're just going to formally release. So if you go there right now and you don't see it, don't panic. We're going to have it up in just a few days. It's just releasing now. We just wanted to have it demoed here to give you an idea Great. what it will look like. Great. Well, you know, before we start, we we, we did purchase the uh, the SSDs. We got the uh, series, 3200 series, uh, the Intel SSD 3200 series. 
Uh, these roughly cost, and it's a, probably a lower grade uh, version of the SSDs. The 520s are a little bit faster, but when I looked at some of the pricing uh, that are out there, and that's the drive everyone we're using that has the, this type of millisecond range. Uh, these are the uh, Seagate one terabyte Barracuda drives. So here, let me just spread this out a little bit. Um, the 520 series is a much faster uh, SSD. You're going to pay a few dollars more for it. But just for the, just to give you an idea before we show the test and the performance, if you look at the just the cost value of two SSDs, you know, even from Amazon or somewhere, you can get them anywhere between $219 to 184 So if you add the cash cane and about $420 for the SSDs, you're going to have a solution where it saves you the cost of purchasing S uh, SAS drives at 15K. Yeah, exactly. So, the cost of right, exactly. Uh, so that's why I wanted to bring this up. All right. So basically, I have uh, the one terabyte of Seagate drives here, and how I started was I, uh, I'm remotely going into the DSS v6 with the Mega Raid Storage Manager, and I'm seeing all my drives here from my 14 uh, one terabyte SATA drives, and then of course my two SSDs. Once I was able to go in there, then I had the option from selecting from the 9265. Ray controller, and here I was able to have the option to create the cache cave, which you don't see right now. Now, near the end, everybody, we can, what we'll do is we can re delete the uh, virtual drives in a cache uh, cave virtual drive that we have, and then be able to set it up for everybody at the end. But to, to speed things up, we wanted to hurry up and provide you just the setup. Now, when I first did the cache cave, I really didn't have the option. I put two SSDs here. And here you see you got RAID 1. Well, when I was thought that if I selected RAID 1, I would be able to do right back. And apparently I couldn't with that. Yeah, so is, is that something that's coming later on, or is, am I actually doing right back in many ways? Yeah, I mean, in the way that the, the cache cave caching works, it's a little bit different from the way that the um, onboard cache works. Got it. So, yeah, in this case, we can... We can look at that detail. That should, I would think that that would be um, right back in the way that it's used. Correct. But that that may be just something. Cascade in itself is the the cascade array is being used as a cache. So while it says right through for that that virtual drive, it's being used as a cache itself. So it's kind of like. A, um, it's not like a, a standalone uh, virtual drive where you're, when you say right through or right back, you're talking about for this um, virtual drive, am I going to cache it with the onboard controller cache? Right. Okay. In the case of the cache KPD, it actually is the cache. Got it. So it's, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. Because that, that, that was something I'm sure a lot of them were going to have to ask. Yeah. So the relationship <laughs> between the hard drive BD and the cache KPD. It's totally different. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Now, on the um, – now, obviously, if I add more SSD drives in there, would that make a difference, or would it be better just to have faster, higher-performance SSDs? So let's say I have the 3200 series, which is a lower-end uh, performing SSD. I'm still going to be maxed out at the drive's performance. So probably it would be better if I really – instead of adding more SSDs on the lower end, the lower cost, I'm really not going to gain any more if I were to have, let's say I have four 30, uh, 320 Intel series SSDs yeah. at the lower ends versus having two high end. Well, uh, I think that's similar to how you look at, at uh, hard drives. For okay. example, you could have, you know, um, if you have four 7200 RPM drives, you could say, well, I want to add, you know, four more or eight more, or I could just want to have, like, for 15K drives. It's really the same thing, right? depending on what performance you're getting per SSD. Now, when I uh, basically set my properties here, mm -hmm. and uh, when we'll answer their questions coming in, um, I basically set my read policy. I just defaulted this. The only thing I did was change uh, here. I wanted to force it because I have a UPS on the back end. Mm -hmm. And we get a lot of questions like this. If I have a yes. really robust UPS and maybe I'm a data center and I have a, sure. a generator in the back that's going to last, you know, three or four days. Sure. Um, is, and I, I try to force right back 
And I, then I want to go ahead and use cached I.O. If it's read somewhere you want to use cached I.O., I don't know. Is that something that you recommend? Well, I think in terms of, you're right, in terms of the, the always write back or not, that is, you know, an individual decision. And that goes back to the cash vault idea. If you've got a BBU or right. cash vault, then you're all set. Um, and you can even set it, you know, one of the other options is as long as my backup, either a BBU or cash vault, is working properly, write back. If for some reason that fails, fall back to write through just for, as a safety reason. Or you can say, I know that even if I have a BBU or cash vault and for some reason it's not working, I've got enough, you know, battery backup for the system that I'm, I feel safe to just do um, right back. We see a lot of things. That's just with your product. But many products that with the when the BBU goes out, the battery backup unit, um, all of a sudden it goes through a right through state. Right. Uh, because it, it has to. Method. Right, right. It's a protection method. And then if you don't, what happens is that uh, you can lose data if you don't. Yeah. So that, that's reason. Yeah, in terms of the I.O. policy, there, there'll be a, a guide. What we're also going to be doing is updating. There'll be a, a user guide um, on the link for the uh, Cascade Pro 2.0, and it'll explain exactly what you want to do depending on, you know, what kind web of Web servers, you're file servers, yeah. uh, database servers, things of that nature. Yeah. So this is what I have right now for our test. Yeah, that's and I've got the access uh, default read-write and, of course, the disk cache policy. Um, do we want to use that, or is that something that is going to be any improvement at all? I get, I yeah, get some guys who say it doesn't matter. Well, typically the default there, meaning unchanged, is saying whatever the drives are already. So it's basically saying, do I also want to utilize the cache on the individual hard drive? Is that going to give me more performance? Um, it typically does, and that's why I've, I've not heard of a drive that has it and turns it off. So by unchanged, we're basically saying just go with whatever the disk is set to. Got it. So for if so if some if for some reason the disk drive had it turned off, got it. We would also say we want to not use it. And then the last one, and then we'll ask for some questions. Um, the background initialization. You know, we do the initialization, which is more of a low-level format. Right. You know, we're writing with all zeros, and that could right. take a lot of time. And we know a lot of manufacturer EMC requires it uh, uh, when you create a block device. Right. So I. I what are your thoughts on that with the new drives that are out today? Uh... Yeah, so really the, the way that background initialization works is that in a, in a typical init, what we do, what we call fast, is we do the, um, uh, the, the most pertinent section uh, of the drive, basically the, the section that would hold your master boot record, et cetera. And after that's done, which is maybe just a few megs, then we move on and do a background init for the rest of, the BD. That way you can start using it faster. Got it. But in a lot of cases, and it's totally understandable, and a lot of people do use it, they say, I want every sector on the drive to be initialized and make sure all media errors, if I have any, are taken care of Correct. before I start. For so, data security. Yeah, right. I'm not even going to install anything on the, the drive. But this is an option of if I want to just get going faster and then still check it over time, but I want to kind of get going. Right, you know, right, right. I don't want to wait eight hours to, you know. I think Janice hours. is going to hit us over the head if we don't answer her <laughs> questions. Go ahead, Janice. Question. What do you got? Question from Eric. Will I be able to use the MakerAid Storage Manager on a system with OpenE installed, noting that OpenE is not Windows-based? Currently right now, no. We, we, we can manage the MakerAid Storage Manager. I mean, sorry, the LSI Ray Controller. Um, what we... It's it's kind of you're talking about a, a another GUI application that's going to have to be installed on a DSS and that would be very complicated. Currently, right now, if we look at the DSS, here's where we're able to configure the LSI array controller. But for the Mega Array Storage Manager to be installed on the DSS, it would be be almost a whole new. It would the cost would be just a, a, too much to for us to uh, probably do that because if you look at the Mega Raid Storage Manager is a lot here, and uh, I don't think we'd have to whole, have a whole new section in our GUI to be added on. Now, what, do you have the and this is Java Bay. Well, it could be, but it's yeah. just a lot of work for this. You so, know, I mean, the one thing that the Mega Raid Storage Manager has that the, it's not built in on the DSS is the firmware capability. Um, mm -hmm. So if you look at the DSS here, we don't have the ability to take through firmware. Uh, this costs us a lot of money to put in here. But again, it's it's really effective because we can change the write policies on the fly. Now, even if I change them here, and this is for the SSD, 
even if I change to right back and I hit apply, it will flip it right and force it go to right through. Oh, okay. You've got yeah, yeah, so it locks it down. Okay. Is there another question? No. Nope. Okay. okay. Um, so as we as we move forward from the Mega Ray, we've completed our virtual drives. We're ready to go into the DSS. And from this standpoint, what we'll see here is a complete automatically DSS will upgrade and update and populate the GUI and show you what's what's happening, what's set up and also uh, what is the attributes that are going on for this uh, virtual drive that's set up with the SSD. So now what we have here is on LD1 and LD0. LD1 is our um, larger volume, the RAID1. We created a RAID1 due to because of time constraints. So here you see it. We're also, if you look for information about the drive, you can pick up the information here and see their status. So what we did was uh, created a volume group from the virtual drive of the 13 terabyte from the 14 one terabyte drives. And once I did that, um, we were able to have the volume group here. And here's where we create many logical volumes, NAS, iSCSI, Fiber Channel. And for example, all I really did was create new iSCSI volume and created it. Uh, I can add it to an existing target, create a new target, and pretty much set it for any size value. Now, for this demonstration, what we're showing you here is we have a two gigabit button, which is the LV000. And the reason, and I think Charles, you'll agree with me, if I had a 200 gig and we were to demonstrate this, we'd be here for a good hour. Because the algorithm is going to be selecting what is the most recently used data to be able to show the high IOPS, which we're going to show with the IO meter. Uh, once I did that, then I pretty much want to go to the I went to configuration, ice goes to the target manager, and here you'll see on the left side my targets, and now we have, we're going to be working with target zero. Um, so here you can see the size, two gigabit volume. Now at this point, all we're going to be doing is connecting with the Microsoft iSCSI initiator, which I've already done. Um, here you'll be able to connect it to your target, which you're going to point to the IP address of the DSS v6, and then at that point, You'll see in your disk manager, you'll see the two gigabit target that we've created. Now, I don't want to format it because there's a different method for formatting on performing tests. So uh, we have this on our blog, and I'll be happy to show others at the end. When you want to test for IOPS uh, on a formatted uh, volume on our target, and then we will give you what's called the test creator from our we've already created and use it with IOMeter. Make sure that you put it in the root directory. So once I have this, I think we're ready to go with the I.O. meter and show the performance. What I've done on the, let me spread this out a little bit, make sure everybody sees it. So what I have done is on uh, I.O. meter is basically set up uh, two workers. You can put more, as many as you want. And we have our disk targets. Here's our two gigabit volume. Uh, yellow is, is a formatted volume, and blue, or cyan, whatever you want to call it, is the unformatted uh, volume here. So I have two workers here. Each have the checklist in there. And I put uh, outstanding IOs. The basic of we use when we test is 16 per target. Now what I've done is then I want to specify my pattern and how I create it. So for this demonstration, we're going to do a read pattern. Let's take a look. You can create a new one. Uh, I specified the name read pattern. I left it at uh, 2K, and I made 100% random writes. You do 100 sequential, but everybody knows about sequential being that you're always going to have the best performance improvements on sequential. So here in random, this is what we want to demonstrate. And then, of course, typically it defaults to 80%. I like to go 100% on my reads when I'm doing randoms. And once you're done with that, you specify OK. And now you'll have your uh, new specification. And now we can add our read pattern. Now, once you add it, you want to make sure that it's set for each worker. So here I put on worker 2. And let's make sure that worker 1 has it. And now we're ready to perform our results. Uh, one thing. We'll yeah, go ahead. Go back. I just want to make sure you had just, it was it just the, uh, OK, yeah. Let's, I, some reason I was being uh, no, actually, on the first worker. you know what's interesting? How come we're not seeing my, uh, okay, we're, we're there. 
So yeah. there we go. We got 16. There we go. Okay. Um, we got to read patterns for each one of them. All right. Now we get them. Well, I'll put it at two seconds and let's fire it off. And I don't need to see the results because we're going to see it in real time. And it spiked up. So now we're up to 15,000. Uh, 15,000 IOs is not bad. Now here's what we've got. We have 17, 17, uh, we got 14 drives, 14 one terabyte drives. And by themselves without the cache cave, uh, we we'll probably have around about, I would say 1400 to, to 1500 IOPS because you're taking each drive, let's say one, uh, let's see, one millisecond, which is one thousandth of a, of a second. And you do the math, it real simply is that the one thousandth of a second divided by 8.5 or, or 9. And that comes out, and then it comes out to, uh, the IOPS times the amount of drives you have. Yeah, those drives are very, very low IOPS because they're, these, these drives, I mean, it's a really excellent point. These drives are actually built more for sequential use, um, but they're, uh, less expensive. But this shows how leveraging even drives that are not even built for random access, when you leverage the SSDs in Cache K Pro, it actually gives you um, high random performance. Right. So if we were just to do some basic math in front of everybody, if I take a, the calculator here and say 1,000 for a millisecond divided by, let's just say, uh, 9, because you're right, there's sequential drives, so it's going to be a little slower. But it gives us 111 IOPS per drive. Yeah, they're very, they're, their IOPS are very low, again, because typically – when you use these kinds of drives, they're not even thinking about IOPS. Correct. They're thinking it'll go 100 megabytes a second, and that's fine. And if we times that by 14, and this is without the cache K, so we're going to get about 1,500, 1500 IOPS if we did the regular RAID zero with just the drives. So when you take the comparison of the cache K and two SSD drives, and we are, I would say, almost 12 times faster and, and that is an, an incredible improvement on not only performance, but bringing value, which saves you costs of using the SAS 15K drives yeah, uh, by itself. Exactly. And that I'll tell you. And it's, it's sustaining around that number. Now, I did let it go for about a good hour, and I got as close to about 16,000. Yeah. So, right, from a low-performing drive, I mean, they're, they're storage grade, but they're not the top enterprise performance grade. Right. Yeah, not, not for random, but you can Correct. use them with SSDs to get... Correct. I mean, you can, well, you can add another, uh, RAID array. Uh, and, and now that was a question I was going to ask why we're let this running. Is, can, is there a way to split this to a sign where I could have another virtual drive underneath here that would say, let's say it'd be a RAID 10? Can I, can I split those off or would I have to, I can't divide the, uh, the SSD caching that I have right now and say, okay, this is going to be part for this virtual drive and, of course, another virtual drive. Yeah, well, if you look here, um, you right-click on the cache page, it should say, yeah, associated virtual drive. So this is where, you know, you could assign another virtual drive, but then they're going to be sharing that pool. So it's usually... I mean, Technically, you may be able to do that, but it's good to have one-to-one -one because it's just a, you can see, okay, I know that this has this much data, and I know that I'm, I'm getting that full benefit. But you know what you can do? What you could do is then you take your less expensive SSDs to put them on your less yes. expense, uh, you, you can, which won't cost you that much. Sure. When sure. you start doing the math, you have uh, $260 for the cash cave. Uh, which is not going to limit you how you use the many SSDs for your virtual drives. Sure, yeah. It's similar to, for example, you know, if you have uh, an 8-drive RAID 5, some people, or if you have 8 drives, some people would choose to put, let's say, their OS on that RAID 5 as well as everything else, their data. Right. Now, you can do that, and it's sharing, you know, the 8 drives, which is, you know, the same volume. It's just all simpler. But some other people would say, well, even though I only have eight slots, I want to have two drives just for the OS and a RAID 1 and six drives for the data. Right. It's right. just, you know, depending on, well, you know. The, I see the, a lot of applications. you're hitting it. Right, right. And I see a lot of applications that you can create on here. I mean, 
uh, if you really wanted to be robust. Now, do you recommend multiple RAID arrays on the 9265? Is it able to keep up? If you, let's well, say I've got a lot of guys, I've got a lot of engineers that will use RAID 10 in a, in a very robust um, VMware environment. Mm -hmm. And so they have a lot of high IO, high IO demands mm -hmm. from those virtual machines, mm -hmm. uh, sequential databases that right. they're needing. And so yeah, yeah. they'll do a RAID 10, and of course they'll have some needs for performance for, uh, you know, faster than normal bit bucket. Sure. So if I were to take my two SSDs, let's say the 520 series from Intel or even the, the other ones that are newer that came out that are very high performing, put that on a RAID 10, gosh, my IOPS would be off the chart. So that's yeah. going to get close to your 45,000 IOPS on your newer products coming out. Yeah, well, 450,000. I'm sorry, so 450,000. Yeah, and I think, again, it depends on what your demands are. If you've got, I mean, it's a perfect example is even if one application doesn't do, uh, you know, 450,000 IOPS, right. you could still have, if you've got multiple uh, clients or multiple virtual machines, things like that, it, it will aggregate up to that level. And, again, it's the choice of the user. Sometimes if you want to have, you know, segregated out your specific BDs for specific uh, uses, you can do that. Or if you want to have them all in a shared pool, you know, you can do that too. Right. So, yeah, that's uh, it's all for the user. But for a low-end drive, we're still around 15,000 average, which is, I mean, yeah. it's, it's great. I, 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 that's why I'm very happy to show this in front of a lot of engineers. Um, we do have a, a company that's trying to push about 450 to 500,000 right now, mm -hmm. and they're all SSDs. Mm -hmm. What we'll do is we'll stop this, and uh, I think possibly some people probably want to see how we create the cascade. So we'll do it. Let's just blow away the uh, DSS V6, and uh, we'll kill that machine. So just give me a second, everybody, and what we'll do is we'll putty into the DSS V6, and we're going to delete the volume, and then we'll go ahead and kill the uh, cascade and the RAID RAID that we've built. So just give me a second, and we'll show this momentarily. How are we doing on time, Janice? We're good. We're 40 minutes in. I'm plasma. <laughs> it does. All right, so we're we're right now doing something that's just not recommended. I don't recommend just to <laughs> you know, do test live data, but we are um, we're trying to get everybody to see how this is done so we can squeeze it in. Uh, we don't have a, a huge budget with many 9265s floating all over our offices. So we'll go ahead and reboot this, let this guy do what he does normally, and let's go back to the Mega Ray Storage Manager. So let's go ahead and um, you can go ahead and we'll go ahead and delete uh, the RAID array or the which one you want to delete first and kill so we can you show. Want, you create both of them? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can go ahead and uh, delete. Usually the Oh, well, best get, practice is delete the thing that's using the other thing first. <laughs> yeah, we should have done. Well, the problem is, is that, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. well, we, we got time. We got something else. What we're doing, everybody, is we're going to let the DSS come back online, and then we'll attach to uh, the RAID array. What I want to show everybody, basically, about the, when you want to test, let's just go to our website here. You can see it. You want to test the a formatted, Drive where we did it unformatted. I want to show everybody where to do this and how to do it. If I take you all the way down here to our blog, or basically if you just type in blog, if I can spell properly, blog.openmeshi.com. Um, here, what we have is a lot of articles. Of course, we talk about a lot about SSDs. Um, and basically uh, SSD marketing versus reality because we know that there's a lot of SSDs that are really not reliable. And I really need to stress this. We have seen cases people thinking that they bought an SSD for a real bargain. Unfortunately, you will suffer. Cheap ain't good and cheap and good ain't cheap. Yeah. That, that kind of concept. Yeah, and we do have our the, the uh, compatibility list on the LSI. Um, channel website where you can look at the latest and greatest. We've actually just posted an updated one where you can see the. Uh, Maybe you guys, can you point to that site? Yeah, sure. that yeah. site? Yeah. Let, me, let me pull that up for you guys real quick here.
It's www.lsi.com slash channel. That's very important. Um, you can just go under. Support, compatibility, all right, and then it basically just breaks up the compatibility list among the different um, components, and that top one. Connection might have been interrupted. Closed webinar. I can still see you, but I no, we're still live. Okay. Yeah, we're live on here. It could be just that you're, I'm not sure. Anyway, I don't know if, uh, it looks like we may not have Adobe Maybe. on here. But anyway, that, it's a PDF file. And you can, uh, you can grab it there and um, we keep it updated. Let's see if we have it. Yeah, I may not have it on there. Yeah, that's no problem. What we could do is, uh, let's go. That's basically just where you can grab it. That same and that same page that will update. Um, it's not uh, it's not going to be the same all the time. But uh, if you keep that page bookmarked, you can always go and get the latest and greatest before you want to make a purchase. Right. Let's see. Uh, save file PDF. I should. Oh, that's right. We don't have it on this system, but we'll have it on another one. Um, but that should be enough for them to be able to get to. So anyway, let's go back to. What we wanted to show otherwise it was the if you're going to do a test, and then by the way, that server screaming is what you're hearing. He's going, Where's my volume? So I had to go back here to shut it and shut him up, and he didn't want to shut up. <laughs> so uh, basically, there is the random versus sequential explained. I think everybody should review this um, blog. So it gives you different variances, and I uh, recommend reading this. Uh, the one that I want to point to. I'm finding it right. Let's see. It's for the next one. Uh, let's see. Right in here. A few practical tips about IO meter. Here we provide you the test file creator. So with with an unpartitioned uh, disk is what we showed. Uh, you could start the test at once. Uh, but if you have a formatted disk, you need to use this test file. So just go ahead and click on either the text right here or the free download. Then what you want to do is you want to make sure that that file uh, is on the root of that uh, formatted disk. So here you can see you get some performance values here that are really important to read about. And then, of course, uh, you know, be able to get those values. You know, on getting that, I'm really curious what we can provide on showing it once more. Maybe if we go into, let's see, go ahead and type it in now. Uh, this oh. system does have the Adobe. I wanted to make sure everybody sees that. Oh, sure. Go back to www.lsi.com slash channel. He's up. All right. And again, just support and sorry, report compatibility. And then that first one, 926x, 928x. Got it. There we go. Um, and yeah, just recently updated. And what it basically will show you, page down, um, all the. Oh, okay, right, right, right. And these are like JBODs, enclosures, motherboards, right. cables. Got it. Drives, and then we do have a specific section here: past hard disk drives, four solid state drives. Got it. So those are the ones, and as you see, the Intel, the 320s. Right, right, right. They're in there. Yeah. Right. So yeah, okay. That's a great, uh, great reference. Okay, I think we're back up. So let's go ahead and get on to the, and we'll demonstrate the um, setting up the Mega Ray Storage Manager, and then we'll conclude. Back in the old days, you had to wait a long time to be able to wait for Java to upload. Here, it's much faster with this version. Uh, the default is RAID for the username. Password is RAID. And now we're going to go ahead and uh,
And we can go ahead and delete fourth deletion and confirm. Yep. Of course, we don't recommend this all the time for people who have data. And there's a little bit of a moment here, so what we'll do is we'll just give it a second, and then we're going to go ahead and kill the cache cache setup as well. So this way we start from the beginning and show everybody it only takes a few minutes, and then we'll be done. Yeah, again, that concept of always delete the client first. Yeah. That's so the, you delete the VD that uses the cache cache VD, and then delete the cache VD. Right. That would still... Yeah, I noticed that you have to, um, you'll see, when, yeah, you'll refresh. Sometimes that, uh, when I was working with it, playing around with it, uh, I noticed it was still there. And if I, uh, logged out, logged back in, but here then I just went to manage and hit F5, then I was able to, but you give it a second because it's communicating back. Oh, right, right. So, so well, well, the other thing to remember, if you do delete the cascade BD, you're not going to lose any data, at least if you're just using it for read caching. Since we just did a read cache, I mean, it's, it's a little bit more delicate now that we do read and write caching. Right. But from a read standpoint, you're not going to lose any data. It's not copying data to the cache, to the the, the uh, cache cave. It's, I mean, it's not moving it. It's just copying. It. Right, so right. So even if you lost it, your performance would go down, but you wouldn't lose any data. Great. Any question? Yeah. Um, the Intel 320 has low write endurance, and cache cave seems like it will be performing a lot of writes and deletes. Any estimated lifespan for these particular SSDs when you use this cache cache drive? Yeah, that really is more of a question for Intel. I mean, in terms of the specific, I mean, it's hard to say. And in general, it's kind of like asking, well, how much, how how many bad sectors will you have on a constellation, so you get constellation drive? We really never give any data on that because it completely depends on the I/O use. Um, and I think the way the drive manufacturers do it, I don't want to speak for them, but I think in general, the way the drive manufacturers do it is they just look at, you know, if you did X amount of data every day for 10 years or, you know, three years, that's how we can. It's like MTBF. They just kind right, of right, right. I was just thinking about this. You're getting something that's uh, something that has a pattern that you can really predict. Right. Yeah. But yeah. even with Cascade, even though you're using a specific application being a cache, it would still depend on well, you know, how many times that turned over, how many writes you did, whether you're using it for write and read caching. And there's also another factor is how, I mean, who can actually test for five years? Right. Without, a, simulated. Product, simulated. Right, right, without a product, I think that happens with any product. Yeah. How can you test for five years without a product being developed? Well, and it is, a, it is. I know there's some simulations that they can probably run as close, sure. but they're not 100%. Like MTBF. Correct. Yeah. And it's very, very... Um, dependent on your SSD manufacturer. That's they have time their, between failure, Janice. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> they have their, sorry. <laughs> they, they have their own, uh, you know, uh, estimates. And calculations, calculations, right, calculations, right, right, right. Yeah. Time versus usage. Sure. All right, well, let's go ahead and, and set up uh, what, what would you do first? I mean, obviously we have our uh, setup here, so let's go ahead and set up our cache cache, or do you set up the virtual drive first? Which one? Well, you can actually do it um, either way. Yeah, I've done it different times. I'm trying to remember. Will it stop you if you don't? The, do it the only way. thing I noticed when I didn't, when I created the, uh, I it was better for me to create the cache K first. Then when I created the um, the array, mm -hmm. and the, just but, say, do you want do you assign, want to assign to the yeah, cache so, K? Yeah. So basically, well, it's a good thing in practice. It's probably a good thing to do it with SSDs first. With SSDs first. Because then you don't make the mistake of trying to, and we'll probably alert you to this, but we don't. Uh, you won't make the mistake of mixing SSDs with hard drives in your array. Right. Well, you notice I noticed I couldn't oh, do I it. I couldn't even put the. Uh, it wouldn't even select the SSD in my array when you do it. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah. yeah. that's well, pretty, but it's not your, it's not something you want to do. So right, right, right. right. Yeah, yeah, I agree, I agree. But just you know, just in practice, um, again, what you're doing here is just you know, you have the choice. You could still do a two drive grade zero if you wanted to, um, for better performance. But then you lose your, you lose like your data. Time. Right, right. I just did a raid zero, zero. I mean a raid one. So you put two drives right. over. You create this drive. Right. Go to next. The next, put your title, save. leave your title, then create brochure, and that's okay. locked down. Will that ever say right back? 
I don't think so, only because of the function that it's being used for the caching. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. we went over that. Okay. And this, yeah, this this may be an artifact, though. Uh, this message saying that it can only be used for reads, won't support writes. That's that may be a relic. I mean, like I said, the, the MSM that will support will formally this support will change a little on bit. Thunderbolt. Yeah, or I'm, I'm sorry, using code names on the 1965, 9285s. That's right. Um, MX5 for us. Well, yeah, we'll we'll be out we'll be out um, shortly on the website. Right, so right. This one supports it on the uh, 9260, 9280. But um, let's go ahead and just uh, yeah, go ahead. Do just that. Do the next. Do next. And that's what our readout is. Very and good. Finish. And so then, when you go to um, There so comes. now you see your, your virtual drive there. And basically what will happen then is if you go and create a virtual drive, again, I'm just right, this right, is right, right. tight on your display. I'm right clicking right. on the controller. Right. And so you go to, uh, you want to do simple? Or I do advanced. Yeah, we'll do you know, advanced. Most engineers are going to do advanced. Sure. And we'll just do a RAID 0. And, you know, RAID 0. And, and just click and drag all of them. Shift it. Okay. Add them all. Great drive group. Great drive group. Next. And then SIO you set to cache. Well, and, and yeah, we're only doing no initialization. Yeah, I don't want to do initialization. Because it's a rate zero. Now you start size depending upon the type of data that you plan on having. So whether you have small files or large yeah. files, I noticed that, uh, you, well, now you're increasing to one meg. Look at when you click on well, that. Well, yeah, we have a, a, a range here and there, again, that will depend on the data you're using. What we also have on our website is a general performance guide right, that right. will kind of tell you. That. What right. we've determined is 256 is a good kind of Next, right. yeah, the right. best kind of way to do it. Um, and again, you know, the other policy. I mean, this is all standard mega rate stuff. Right. So we'll just go ahead and create the, the virtual drive. I was just complaining about the BBU. Right. And then next. And then. And then finish. Now, this is the part that it should come up to say, is this what you want to assign with your SSD or your, your cache? Yeah, pay? I think that should come up. Uh, okay. There it is, right here. here. So because it sees that there's been, and this is the difference between doing it the other way, but this way, which is, you know, I agree with Todd, this is the best way to do it. Have your cache available already. So when you're done creating yeah. your array, yeah, I think that makes it sense. says, okay, right. here's what you've got available you want to use caching. You don't have to. For example, if you had multiple arrays and you didn't want some of them to use the cache, you could just say, I don't want to use it. Right, right. And so, or you could have different pools of SSDs. So if, so if I had multiple uh, virtual drives in here, I could select all of them to be used on the cache case. But the right. problem, like you said, you're robbing resources for what it's supposed right. to do. But you could create, you could have, you know, three cache case uh, BDs and three arrays, and you could assign one each to one, one for yeah, that. Yeah, right, right, right. If you wanted to. So we say yes. So now we're associating that Cascade um, virtual drive with this hard drive virtual drive. Sorry, was that a question? Yeah. yeah, I do have a question. Okay. Um, from the audience, does it support 64 terabyte LUN in the cache memory size? Is it over 500? Let's talk about that. What happens if somebody does have, like right now we have, uh, Let's say he, he does have, let's say, a 64 terabyte volume. Um, and, yeah, well, and, if we're, and, and what would be the appropriate size? I guess you would have to evaluate how much, well, how much data you actually really are going to have. So let's say I'm going to have, you know, maybe of that 64 terabyte in a year's time, we're going to be focusing on VMDK files or, or we're going to be focusing yeah. on a database file. And I guess that's going to grow probably maybe five terabytes or it's going to be a pool of five terabytes. Right. So for cache case, so how you um, calculate that's a good question. Let me, let me just pull this up. I just sure, want to give sure. you guys Take a time. reference here. Now, in terms of the the um, hard drive, that's the same limit as as it's always been. There's no different uh, difference for that. Right. Um, but what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to navigate to it. In terms of the cascade volume. I just want to go back to this channel website. I actually wanted to tell you guys, uh, show you guys um, what I was talking about in terms of looking for the code. 
you want to make sure that when you go to products, instead of going to the controller you have, go down to advanced software options. Okay. Because there are times where the advanced, the, the cache cave firmware will branch off from the mainline firmware. We try to keep them merged as much as possible, but there are times where the standard firmware for someone who does need cascade will get us in for this feature. This is good that you're bringing this up because this will uh, close and, that issue also. I mean, it's just yeah. And, it, and this is yeah. This is some basic information here, but then under specifications, it gives you the amounts of um, oh the max. Yeah. So there is a max of five twelve gigs. Now, in general, we've said you know ten to twenty percent of your hard drive array. So, it so, wait, wait, so, so, so what, first of all, what you're saying is I've got a maximum capacity for the caching and be only at a 512 gig. Mm -hmm. So I only, I max out on many, oh, let's say I got three SSDs at 160 gig. We've already maxed out because I can't get another one. Yeah. Yeah. There is a limit right now. And it's, Why is there a limit? Just out of curiosity. Is it just because of the, the algorithms or the way it's using the caching and to be allocated through uh, what's hotly being used in the yeah, files? I, or? I think when you think about the resources that are allocated to, you know, and as we move into, you know, the end of this year, we're moving up to the next level of our SAS 3 12 gigabit, much more powerful rock. As we move forward, we'll be able to expand. But right now, you know, in terms of balancing the resources of, you know, managing, you can have, you know, you could have a hard drive array of, you know, 100 drives. Right. And so balancing all of that, you know, and it's a lot of work we wanted to, yeah, especially, and what we always want to do is have something that is, you know, um, enough features and enough, in this case, a large enough array to be valuable, but also, you know, keep it to where we know we can keep it solid. We always want it to be, you know, rock solid. Right. So that's where we really want to focus for now. But yeah, that is the limitation now of 512. You know, as drives get bigger, that could be one SSD, or you now, split it from could, one. Could I have, okay, so, like, if, if that question he, that he asked, and let's say this cache case, if I create another virtual drive uh, cache case, mm -hmm. does that mean that my max is 512, or can I have many that are 512? Well, as it goes here, this is per controller. Oh, okay, got it. So, it doesn't matter. So, so yeah, exactly, okay. Per controller, because, again, we don't want to spend too much too much of our resources managing. You're going to need games. multiple CPUs to we're be able to handle that. Yeah, we're still and you'll have that on the controller. Yeah, we're still looking at rate. Even with a dual-core controller, we're still making sure, first and foremost, because, again, this is a cache. We need we need to make sure we've got the horsepower to address the, where the data is actually stored and keep that flowing as fast as possible. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, we've That's got, it. That's the last that. question. All right. Oh, yeah. um, there's no questions. I want to thank everybody uh, for joining us. Um, I know probably many of you are going to probably want to get a hold of Charles, but I will tell you he is a busy boy like we are all, all are. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> probably what would be the best place if they have additional information because they're usually going to come to us. And then after yeah. that, um, I mean, is there well, – Yeah, as I mentioned here, I mean, either specifically – Just right in this general area. Yeah, you can look for basic things, you know, features and benefits. Specifications, if you remember, well, what's the max again? You know, that's a good, you know, correct, there. correct. But then also the resources. I mean, there's you know videos here, there's uh, white papers, technical briefs, solution briefs, and then also um, the user guide itself. So this is you know, this 25 meg document. This is actually the entire um, user guide for Mega Raid controllers. But all of the Cascade, there's a section in there for Cascade, which is the latest and greatest. So it probably has the fast path and it has the Cascade. Yeah, it's, 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 the, it's the, the whole suite. But this will go through exactly how to, you know, create a Cascade array, what it is, how, how to, you know, specifically set it up in BIOS or Mega CLI or, um, you know, MSM. And there is a case, you know, if you have, you mentioned it earlier, if the you know MSM is working out, or, or for whatever reason, you can use the BIOS option to create it just as you're bringing the system up. 
you know, and you always know that the one thing about BIOS that can be valuable, it's, you know, it's not as, as feature rich and it's not as, you know, user friendly, but the, the, the one benefit to it is that you know you always have the right version because the BIOS and the firmware are tied together. Correct. So with MSM, I mean, this is another thing where when you go to support and downloads, um, this is where you're going to find your latest code. And, you know, under management software and tools, this will have, you know, all of your latest um, um, software and tools. Now, this will be updated again. Right, right, so right, right. There now. Right, right. Um, and then firmware here, this this states that it only supports the 9269. Correct. This is the older. Right. It's still Pro 2.0 if you do use those controllers. Got it. And, of course, the drivers, which are tied in with the open yeah. so. Perfect. Janice, there's no more questions, so we're no questions. we're pretty much done. Mm -hmm. Perfect. All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining uh, the opening today. And uh, Charles, I want to thank you especially. No problem. And um, you've been a wealth of information. All right, everybody.